Khan, on behalf of Physics Society of St. Stephen's College, welcome you all to 24th Annual Popley Memorial, Memorial Lecture Series 2020. This lecture series is very, very important for the entire department where we, where we see and witness an enthusiastic participation throughout. And this is in the memory of our late professor, R.K. Popley. Now, to inaugurate the event, I request our principal, Professor John Wilkes, to come here. So please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to declare this 24th annual Dr. Popley Lectures open. Uh, just a brief note, it works at two levels. One is the dedication and the love that the professor in whose name these lectures are held. He had for the discipline and for the college, and in return, the love and affection that we show him and his memory through these lectures. <coughs> I'm very grateful to you, ma'am, for having consented to uh, give your time and share your knowledge with all of us. You were very gracious enough to say that there's no thanks needed, but I think it's important that we uh, show our appreciation and our thanks to you. Okay. You're very grateful. We look forward to this. I can tell you that here you have a bunch of very excited and enthusiastic young people led by a band of uh, equally excited and enthusiastic professionals. Thank you very much once again. All the best. We're looking forward to this time. Thank you. Thank you. Some of us really knew Dr. Kofi, and the rest of us uh, have an image of him based on what we've read and so on. So I just thought that uh, I'd give you a kind of, i try to give my sense of what it was about Dr. Kofi that made him so important for us. I wouldn't say that uh, he made the same impression on all members of the class. For example, uh, two of my closest friends in physics were one a basketball player and one a number one lafanga of the class. <laughs> and uh, they were not interested very much in what Dr. Pope had to say or deliver. It's also equally true that there were many people who were genuinely interested in physics and on whom Dr. Pope did not necessarily make such a great impression. But it's also true that there of the vast majority of students who stayed on in physics through the years of the physics department of St. Stephen's College. Dr. Popley was an enormous influence. He just made a, an enormous influence on many of us. On me, for example, it was just, you know, I felt like my brain had been opened up after meeting him for the first time in my life. Almost. And I think at this level, it's not just the intellectual qualities of the teacher that matter, but also a certain quality that uh, Dr. Wilson, who had a lot of it, would call presence. He had an enormous presence which sort of galvanized the class. Okay, so I, and you can have presence in many different ways. You can be an, you know, a big giant, you know, come and speak in a booming voice. But Dr. Popley was the exact opposite of that. He was a tiny person. He was about five foot four, or five foot five inches tall, thin, didn't speak very loudly. But there was something, you know, very different about him. And he would enter the class and we would all be alert. And it was like some kind of ember that you just had to blow on slightly and it would, you know, burst into flames. So it was like, he, the moment he came in, the whole class became alert. You may not have been interested. Of course, we were also terrified of him because he would point to someone arbitrarily and say, okay, give me a summary of what we did last time. Uh, and we have to just stand up and do it. But uh, it wasn't just the terror, I think. It was the fact that he really genuinely made a deep impression on us. And I think the impression he made had different impacts on different people. And that, for example, there might have been some people who didn't need this kind of 
uh, impact to be really genuinely aroused to the beauties of physics. But there are some of us who did. I mean, you know, some, there are many of us who came alive to what physics is as a result of our encounter with Dr. Pokey. And I think it was not just the way he approached physics, which was very committed, very, very honest, and very challenging. It was also that he sort of made you feel as if it was your job now to take this on and take it further. And I, that, I think, is one of the greatest things that a teacher can do. It can sort of make, make you feel that it's your responsibility now to do this. I mean, I'm just going to show you what this is like, and now you do the best you can. Okay, for example, you know, uh, I mean, and many of us, unfortunately, become a little too dependent on this kind of thing. I certainly did. For example, when I was a student, I did much better in my first year than in my second and third year, simply because I think Dr. Popley was there. I, mean, just, I felt almost as if his... Uh, Approach to the subject made me want to do everything, not just what he was teaching, but everything much better. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, this kind of thing is very important at the undergraduate level. So while I don't think it's necessary for all teachers to be like Dr. Popley, it's nice to have one or two Dr. Popleys in the career. So with that, uh, you know, I hope that uh, we, I'm sure that we will do great justice to his more than these lectures because he liked this kind of stuff as well. He liked, I think he liked abstract, beautiful things. Uh, so, uh, yeah. great to have uh, spoken about it. About his eminent personality. Now, I'm proud to introduce to you uh, our speaker for the 24th annual Popley Memorial Lecture Series, <coughs> Professor Rohini Bhavgali. Please, a huge round of applause. Professor Rohini Bhavgali is among the best scientists and educators of India. She obtained her BSc from Sir Kwarshu Rambo College, University of Pune, and MSc from IIT Bombay. She then obtained a PhD in Political Particle Physics from State University of New York at Stony Brook. Post her PhD, she joined TIFR Mumbai as a visiting fellow. Since 1982, she has taught at University of Bombay and Indian Institute of Science, where she has been since 1995. Currently, she is an emeritus professor at the Center for High Energy Physics at IISC. Throughout her career, she has authored over 150 research papers and three books. She's an elected fellow of all the three academies of sciences in India and the Science Academy of the Developing World. She's also a part of International Detector Advisory Group for the International Linear Collider at CERN and is the chair of the Panel for Women in Science, which is an initiative of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Her contribution to the field of research and education is widely recognized, and she was awarded Padma Shri for her contribution in science and technology in 2019. Without any further delay, I humbly invite Professor Godwill to start her lecture. I should first thank St. Stephen's College and the Physics Society President and the Vice President for asking me to come here. While I was listening to the introduction, I knew about the lectures even before. I knew about Dr. Popley also. Because if you are anybody in theoretical physics in India, you know at least one or two Stephenians somewhere along the line. And I actually happen to have one in colleague in my department, which is Dr. Deepti Mansen. And I can boast of having been a colleague with perhaps one of the very old Stephenian analysts, and that's Professor Mukunda. So for me, both St. Stephen's and the Popley Lectures were not new, but I was very much honored by your invitation. And actually after listening to what has been told about Dr. Popley, I feel a little worried. <laughs> but we'll see how we go along. And I will give two sort of, uh, how should I say, uh, warnings. First is, today it is almost a popular lecture and I would actually appreciate a feedback to see where I should pitch in the next two lectures. I will tell you what I want to cover, though I have said that in the abstract, it might become clearer. <coughs> and I would actually like that kind of interactive uh, progress of uh, what one is going to cover. Because indeed, this is an extremely wide subject. Picking up some
example, and to do what the right detail can <coughs> actually be. Not such an easy job, and actually, it's symmetric to pick up anything that's interesting. <laughs> All right, so let's see what I'm going to do. I can make this work. I have to do it other way. Somehow, this pointer was my idea that it's a laser pointer. Okay, so what I will do today is actually just talk about the first part of my title. Namely, nature of symmetries. <coughs> and then the second part is symmetries of <coughs> nature, that means symmetries of laws of nature. For a physicist, nature really means the laws of nature. So that is how roughly the division is. So today's is really more or less trying to tell what do we mean by symmetry. You know, we use these words symmetry, invariance, similarity. They are all kind of related <coughs> words. And very often in common speech, we use them interchangeably. But in the context of a technical discussion, each of them have a definite meaning. And some of those meanings I would like to try and... And tomorrow, I want to talk about my particular hero, Amy Nothar. I think it was a great pity that when I was studying, nobody told me that she was a woman. <laughs> there was Maya Tsubasa, there was Ampere's law, there was Norfolk's theorem. And as time went along, somewhere I suddenly realized that, by God, this was a towering mathematician, a woman, and a period when universities didn't even admit women to study mathematics. So I chose this sort of spend a little more time on this, and any theoretical physicist was his or her sort without knowing what Norfolk's theorem is all about. So tomorrow I will try to cover that. And that is essentially relationship between symmetries and conservation laws. Last but not the least, I would actually like to talk about what are what Wigner called dynamical symmetries. That is symmetries of invisible objects. Symmetries of the natural laws which are operated at distance scales much shorter than what you and me can see, not at the microscopic scales, not at the microscopic scales, not at the microscopic scales. They work at the distance scales of nuclei or inside. Distance scales are even shorter than that. And at these distance scales, there are no direct senses by which we can actually understand or try to figure out what the rules are. And the rules of the games at that time have been discovered just because we were guided by the symmetry principles. And that is what essentially I would like to show you and hopefully ending <coughs> that is, I can't guarantee that. Right. So, you know, symmetry, yeah, symmetry at the same time is very similar to understand, even a child can understand it. And at the same time, it's an extremely profound concept. You know, you can think of this. Symmetry can be used very to practical use. You are, you know, you are basically, for example, designing a very complex aircraft. You know, all the systems and so on. So, okay, let me just design a left-right symmetric aircraft. Of course, it's easier to design. Balance is better. But of course, also the technicalities of my design are reduced by half. So, I make my problem much more tractable by using symmetry. This is very practical, no-nonsense application. But actually, we also know that symmetry produces things of beauty. You know, there is this intimate connection already, I think, <coughs> Vikram mentioned it. Beautiful. You already said that. Abstract. Beauty. So, there is this intimate connection between symmetry and beauty. And we can find, we find that actually <coughs> symmetry produces beauty in many things, like in art, in music, in sculptures, what the new name. So, but more than that, the reason I'm standing here in front of you and talking about it is also because the same ideas have provided in the past, I would say, 100 years almost, in the 20th century, this has given us a clarity to our scientific thinking and actually it has lit up paths for future researches for the truth of nature. 
I think that is the reason why I am talking to you here. The first two are beautiful, nice, but the third one is the reason which appeals to a physicist. Is truth always beautiful? <coughs> Actually, we don't know. Huh? However, there are very famous physicists. So this is Hermann Bondi, a cosmologist, who had actually proposed the steady state universe, which as it turns out, is not the truth. Okay. Without we know. When he proposed it, of course we didn't know that that was not the truth. It had fitted all the data that was available at that time. So he tells about Einstein. He used to work with Einstein. So he said, what I remember most clearly is that when I put down a suggestion that seemed to me very cogent and reasonable, Einstein did not in the least contest it. But he only said, oh, how ugly. <laughs> and as soon as an equation seemed to him to be ugly, he really rather lost interest in it and could not understand why somebody else was willing to spend much time on it. He was quite convinced that beauty was a guiding principle in the search for important results in theoretical physics. This is the point here, beauty and symmetry are almost interchangeable. So this deep connection between symmetry and beauty comes out here, that greatest physicist of our times, and I will, as I go along, maybe in the second or third lecture, I'll say this, but his creation, the general theory of relativity, is to my mind, and for many other people's minds, is the greatest creation that came simply from principles. And not, you know, normally most of the laws of nature we actually got from observations. And then some symmetries told us why those laws, you know, are the way they are. Whereas Einstein did something completely different. So what a person like Einstein thought about symmetry is very important for us to keep track of. Actually, Herman Weil, another giant in the subject, actually also said, I always try to unite truth with the beautiful, but when I had to choose one or the other, I always chose beautiful. <laughs> you know, it sounds like a wise crack, but in fact, Weil introduced an equation called Weil equation, which at the time didn't seem to be applicable to the particles that were being found, but lo and behold, Later on, it became a very important equation because it was before. And he had chosen it because it was before. Okay? Alright. So, you know, to me, discussion of symmetry and realizing how understanding, you know, symmetries themselves have driven our research uh, at the heart of matter. That's really what has happened in the last hundred years. And this, therefore, whenever I start trying to discuss this, this kind of a discussion can actually cover almost the whole of 20th century theoretical physics. Because that's what drove the theoretical development. <coughs> and also mathematical developments. I cannot separate one from that. So, in fact, in my mind, symmetries is an ideal subject where the intertwining threads of all branches of sciences, theoretical physics, biology, chemistry, and so on, are very, you know, the intertwining is extremely, extremely obvious and the ideas go nicely from one area to the other. Here is one person who uses them quite nicely. Subject. Okay. So this concept has been a very important part of, I would be like to think, of the intellectual development. So it's something extremely, extremely fundamental and as a particle physicist I can surely say that the developments in particle theory have been really driven by our understanding of uh, the symmetries of nature. So therefore, this is sort of my ode to the symmetries. Bhavan Pai actually says, symmetry is a vast subject, significant in art and nature. Mathematics lies at its root, and it would be hard to find a better one on which to demonstrate the working of the mathematical intellect. So I'm just quoting people for you. So far I have not told you why and how. I am only throwing phrases at you, but I hope the phrases make sense. And this is by the same Herman Weil, who I told you, said that he chose truth over, uh, beauty over truth. 
Then the two other giants who I would say for the first time enunciated a very fundamental symmetric principle of nature. And Poincare or Einstein, they actually that figured out that the it was the electrodynamics of moving media. So how do fields transform when the observer is moving? This understanding was something that was present in Maxwell's equations. But the fact that this structure is so because laws of nature need to be the same irrespective of the state of motion of the observer and that there is a limiting velocity, which is a, a number. These two issues were things that these two gentlemen really enunciated clearly. And then, of course, as I already said, Einstein took the next big leap where he actually found the correct theory of gravitation by demanding that the equations have certain symmetry. So you use the symmetry as a guideline to get the, the correct answer. So for the first time, I would say that the symmetries and invariances were used to find or understand <coughs> observed laws of nature and postulate or get at the correct equation describing the theory. So I would say that if I had to discuss these three people are perhaps one of the most prominent players. And last but not the least is Eugene Wigner. And not surprisingly <coughs> enough, because you please see what is the citation of his Nobel Prize. The citation of his Nobel Prize is <coughs> for his contribution to the theory of atomic nucleus and the elementary particles, particularly through the discovery and application of fundamental symmetry principles. So actually, Wigner was the really the big giant who uh, developed, you know, the ma machinery and he actually discovered, postulated, understood a lot of things about the nuclear dynamics through the applications of the symmetry. He was the one actually who first postulated uh, underlying symmetry in terms of unseen variables, so to say, which I will come hopefully in tomorrow's or last lecture, but I will. I mean, I will try to get there. But some of you will know the name, so I can say, for example, something which finally led to Gelman said for And that was a complete leap. You know, looking here and, I will explain, but looking here and saying, if I rotate a square, the square will look the same if I rotate it to 90 degrees. That's something I can see, I can relate to. But to say, that between two, a neutron and a proton, and they're interacting with each other. If I replace the neutron by the proton, the two protons almost, if I forget about the fact that there is an electromagnetic charge, the two protons and two neutrons actually are the very similar. This was a fact that was borne out approximately through the data, and people like Heisenberg, Wigner, Fermi developed it further. And that idea, I will try to show you in the last lecture, led us then to the eightfold classification of Gelman of fundamental particles. So he, he began that journey. And he actually, I would also say, was a very major player who changed attitudes of physics. <coughs> physicists, sorry, there's a mistake. Physicists told. So in fact, one of the big applications which Wigner showed was how to use symmetry methods to understand what you see in atomic molecular spectrum. That was actually his to the first you know, work. One of the many, right? I should say that. But for a long time, there is a very famous book, again, some of your second year rights, third year rights might know that, Con Condon and Shortley Convention. Okay? So these were the big guys who had explained a lot of uh, spectroscopy. And they were very proudly writing in 1968, we have written a book which does not talk about group theory. I, I, it was to anybody, now it doesn't make any sense because these methods actually at one stroke made to understand things which were only abstracted from the data by people and enunciated as this one's rule, that one's rule, you know. And then Wigner actually came along and said, you know, all these things 
are to be expected. And from a simple fact that Coulomb interaction, I hope all of you know Coulomb interaction is 1 by, potential is 1 by R. And based on this simple fact, seems very strange, no? But everything that we see about atomic spectra can be understood by making use of the simple fact that electrostatic interactions are 1 by R. What is meant by 1 by R? <coughs> that, you know, I am standing here, you have said this is Z axis, this is X axis, this is Y axis. Somebody comes and says, no, I don't like to stand like this, I will stand on my head. And my Z axis will be in my direction of my head. But the potential will still look 1 by R, no? This is very simple put the rotational symmetry of the interaction. And based on this one single thing, the various complex methodologies that were developed by Wigner actually they shown to work. And they were based on this simple thing, you could understand almost everything that you saw in the world of nuclei, atoms. So I hope that kind of tells you what was the worth of this Nobel Prize, okay? It's among many things, this, but for our purposes, that's all that I want. From singing my big stories to you, this is not just my personal opinion, but this particular opinion that symmetries actually drove the development of fundamental physics in the 20th century, the idea of symmetries is actually supported also by the Nobel Prize. Why do I say that? That I will give you many names in the course of these three-day lectures of different scientists who worked on symmetries. And I can tell you that apart from the three mathematicians, <coughs> Michael Weil, I would call him Weil as a mathematician, and Nother, all the other 20 names that I will mention in my talk, all have been given Nobel Prizes beginning, the first Nobel Prize being given in 1973, one or 23, I forget. Then was Einstein's Nobel Prize. One of these years. It was not given for his work on symmetry. Let's understand that clearly. But nonetheless, let's say that all this work has been actually helped us to arrive at the current description of the fundamental particles, their interactions, and understanding properties of solids, and so on and so forth. I will also try to give you some examples what role symmetries are played in other branches such as biology and chemistry. So now having given this big introduction, I will begin with this. I say. That all of us, we use the word symmetry in many, many different ways. First is symmetry and beauty, I already told you. And this is not something which we see now. When I told you symmetry is beautiful, none of you even contested because that is somewhere there clear to us. Actually, it was clear to people from the time of Aristotle, 350 BC. What does he say? He says that the chief forms of beauty in nature are order, symmetry, and definiteness. So, he even he thought the same. Then, actually, symmetry and almost I would call philosophy. That again, I quote Herman Weil: symmetry, various things he says in between, is one idea through the ages that human being has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty and perfection. Mind you, this is the same why you said that given a choice between beauty and truth, I will choose beauty. <coughs> now, what are the, the first thing that comes to our mind when we talk of symmetries? <coughs> it's symmetrical shapes of static <coughs> geometrical objects. That is the first and the foremost. And actually, human beings, you know, this is, so you look at a shape and say, okay, this shape. What does it look like? It's, it, it's a, you know, it's a, if, if it, uh, it's not a very good example. Okay. If I take it like this. If I reflect in a mirror, here, in the center, it looks the same. So it's symmetric under reflection. If I rotate it, then there is a symmetry, right? But this is a little more, I, I should not have picked this up, so I will come back to this in a second. So, let me give you examples of shapes which will look the same under translation, under uh, rotation, and under reflection. 
Then the last, the one that I will spend most time on is the symmetries of laws of nature. <coughs> Physicists particularly have been sort of wanting to describe things simply as, in a simpler manner always. And following Einstein, want to look at an equation which looks pretty, which looks simple. And now at the end of, now in 2000, since 2013, I would say, 12, I would say, I will show you tomorrow a picture. Now we think that the laws of particle physics, world of particle physics, can be written on the back of a picture. And that is possible only because of symmetries. So that kind of, and particularly when we are looking at, I already mentioned this, when we are looking at things that are not directly accessible to our senses. When I am talking about laws of motion of an electron around a hydrogen atom, already I need to develop quantum mechanics. And that is where all those concepts of symmetries have helped me in a million ways, the physicists, to understand this behavior and put it on a very strong foundation. So the laws of Nature are abstracted usually from observations, but the role that the symmetries have played is making understand that these laws of nature are what they are because of certain underlying symmetry in the space and time. For example, Newton's laws of motion. What does Newton's laws of motion say? They say there is no absolute time, there is no absolute point. This point. Uh, in, uh, there is no special point anywhere. And there is no special point of origin, there is no special point of starting of motion. You can call it anything you like, and things are invariant. We will again talk about it tomorrow. But if you are going to say that force is equal to m d2x by dt square on linear motion, and now you say instead of calling x, I call my origin instead of measuring from uh, the point where the motion starts, I will start measuring 5 centimeters behind the line. I will call that my new origin. The equation is not going to change, no? The equation is going to remain exactly the same. So this is an invariance of this equation, right? Translation of coordinates is an invariance of that. That is a symmetry of that And it is this understanding, okay, that actually, you know, now the next part was to abstract these symmetries from the particular situation where you saw it and then apply it to some other situation, like I told you, within a nucleus, two nucleons interacting with each other. So that abstraction was the one of the most important things that symmetries allowed us to do. And symmetries then allowed us to look at dynamics that is really not accessible to us in any other way. And perhaps this is the most complex connection of all these ideas that I have been putting. And this is the one that would we need a lot of discussion on. I will try to give you examples tomorrow so that it becomes more tractable and understandable. And the other thing is that the symmetries, this what this were here what I talked about were static symmetries. Take a shape at a fixed time and look at different operations. Right in a few minutes. But on the other hand, symmetries also uh, indicate constancy of certain quantities. Take again Newton's law. It says the system continues in its state of motion unless acted upon or at rest unless acted upon by a force. <coughs> so if that means the velocity will not change unless I'm acting on the that means mass time velocity will remain unchanged in the motion of the particle if there is no force acting on the particle. That means momentum remains the same even if the particle is moving. So it's not, it's true that now, it's true 100, mi 100 minutes from now if there is no force acting on the object. So therefore, and it can do whatever else it likes if there is no force acting on it, there is no way the momentum is going to change. And you all of you use in mechanics quite often this uh, conservation of momentum. We use it quite blindly, quite happily. Now this conservation of momentum, where does it come from? 
Is it just some abstraction of Newton's? Something that I can understand from the fact that Newton's law, first law is correct? The genius of these people whose names I gave you was to tell that there are actually fundamental reasons why momentum should be conserved. And that is what first Hamilton did it to some extent, but really that's what we know. So that is, and that is the step that is perhaps to me the most exciting of all. And that is where, when you start now, when you go beyond static symmetries, when you start talking about equations of motion and symmetries of equation of motion, that is where you kind of get, get into a very interesting uh, things. So according to Wigner, who as I told you was the father of all this in a big way, he said that there are geometrical symmetries, he called them. So there is a symmetry of shapes, I told you, those are static ones. What he called geometrical symmetries is symmetries of space-time symmetries, like I told you, symmetry of, you know, that is described by Newton's uh, first law. Or, okay, I'll come, I don't want to jump into it right now, so I'll go it next time. And then the second type of symmetries are the dynamical symmetries. I already mentioned them to you. That is the force between two neutrons, force between two protons. They are also seem, they also seem to be governed by some symmetry, underlying symmetry. And that symmetry, how to postulate it, how to test it, and then how to extend that idea, this is what actually the physicists of 20th century. And as I repeated this again and again, that when formulating laws at scales which were much smaller or much bigger, if I'm thinking of what happened in the universe uh, what long time back or what's happening at the edge of the universe now, they are distant scales that I cannot make any head and tell in my mind about. And at such times, using symmetries is an extremely important thing. For example, in cosmology, we use them very so what is symmetry? Symmetry is just an operation or transformation which you perform when the object remains unchanged, invariant, I am using different words for it. Huh? And we use all these words very interchangeably. So what is an example? You know, let me take a very simple example. This is my student Gaurav feeding his daughter. And then in the second picture, his daughter is feeding him. So, if I talk of this operation of exchanging Gaurav with his daughter, and I think of these two pictures as one group, this group remains unchanged, no? Gaurav feeds the daughter or daughter feeds Gaurav? This is the what I can call an exchange symmetry. I mean, this is so trivial in some sense, right? This is with objects that I can see and look. But when we talk of exchange symmetry of electrons, which some of you in the third year might be studying, we are not talking of anything different than this. Okay? So, this is the thing that under an exchange here, this picture, set of pictures goes into themselves. Because when I exchange, this picture goes into this, this picture goes into this. So, if I had only one picture, it would not be symmetric. But since I have two pictures, they are symmetric. Okay? So the set is symmetric. This is a bit, I am bringing in a bit of a, a most important contribution that we have made actually. That again, I will <coughs> make this statement only for third year rights. Very many people can perhaps don't know it, so they can neglect it. But for example, you people are familiar with uh, levels of electron energy levels in hydrogen atom. And for a given value of J, there are two J plus one levels, all of which are degenerating energies. Some of you may understand these words. But those two J plus one levels are nothing but a collection of pictures like this. If I wanted to think about a permutation of three people, maybe I wanted to bring uh, Javier's friend, and then Gaurav feeding Kavya, Kavya's friend feeding Gaurav. I'll have a set of six pictures. Huh? But if I have a whole set of six pictures, then it is completely symmetric under the interchange of these three. That's exactly. So 
when you are looking at the effect of a symmetric operation, you need to look at a group. And that technically is what is called a representation. And this group is not the same as the technical world. Sorry, I will introduce that in a few A set. A set of things. So this is, to some extent, one way in which we can understand what is meant by symmetry. Then this is a, you know, I have a figure like this. If I rotate through 90 degrees, so here, you know, this is my, let's say this is my this axis, this is my uh, x axis. I rotate it. If I rotate it, the figure looks exactly the same. Forget about the later thing. I was not my skills of PTT were <coughs> not good enough that I couldn't remove the A. I took this picture from somewhere on the way. But if because if you include the A, then these pictures are not symmetric. But if you remove that A, if it doesn't exist, you will see that the two go into each other, the two shapes. So that the rotation through 90 degrees is the symmetry of this shape. <coughs> Exchanging the two people was the symmetry of this set of two pictures. Then now I can go on. Instead of rotating only through fixed angles, this circle is a very interesting guy. Because no matter what angle I rotate through, it will remain the same. In fact, the Greeks were so fascinated by it, this is a perfect shape. So Greeks, that's why the Greeks decided that all the orbits, they of course didn't think that the earth was rotating, but that doesn't matter. The orbits of the planetary objects they decided had to be circles. Why? Because it was the most perfect figure of them. Because it was the same no matter what angle you looked at. So again, if I look at myself and I look at my version, which is uh, standing upside down or standing at, uh, with my head like this, things the circle looks exactly the same. So therefore, they thought that yes, therefore, all the orbits have to be circular. As it turns out, <coughs> they were wrong because that is not the simplest prediction. That can be one, but that need not be the only prediction of the symmetry of looking at an object upside down. Straight. Its implications for the property of symmetry can be different, and that's what we are going to hopefully learn tomorrow. Then sphere is the same thing, completely symmetric object, but in three dimensions. Circle is in two dimensions. And then there are these platonic solids, just to show you that people have been thinking about it from a long time. So this is a picture of the platonic solids, and now you can see. Let me take this cube. No, no. This is the pointer is ah, yes, yes. So I, I, I'm going to leave this as a small exercise to you to figure out what are the different ways. Battery ticket, This cube. So what are the different symmetries of this cube? This cube. What are the different symmetries? Can you tell me? What will keep it unchanged? Rotations to 90 degrees. Not arbitrary rotations. Rotations to 90 degrees. Then, if you take a reflection in a plane which is setting inside, it will be the same. Take a reflection around this plane, it will be the same. So, you can figure that out, right? Now, these are different operations which leave the object exactly the same. Now, what happens if I take two operations one after another? If I rotate it first through 90 degrees, then I rotate through another 90 degrees. It will be the same. It is still going to remain the same. If I rotate with yet another 90 degrees, kya hoga? Still it remains the same. But when I rotate it the fourth time, the guy has come back to itself, no? After that, I mean, there is no point in repeating this 100 times. So, there is a finite number of operations. Rotation to 90 degrees, rotation to 180 degrees, rotation to 270 degrees, and rotation to 360 degrees. These four operations actually form a compact set among themselves. You follow one by the other, you combine the two together, you will get 90 and 180, you will get a 270 degree rotation. 270 plus 90, you will get a 360 degree rotation. 360 plus uh, uh, 180, and you will get effectively 180 degree rotation. So these four elements, when you combine them together, will give you one, once again an element of the same set, so you don't go outside this set. So this is a symmetry operation and these four operations, let me call them R1, R2, R3 and R4, 
these four operations form a compact set. Not only that, if I take an operation of rotating it through 90 degrees in one direction, rotation through my opposite direction is minus 90 degrees. So I can rotate it first through 90 degrees, rotate it back to minus 90 degrees, I'll come back to itself. So for every operation, I can figure out what is the inverse. So this is one thing. Then if I don't do anything at all, that's identity, sitting here straight. So a set of such operations that technically in mathematics is called a group. And now once you say that this is a group, mathematicians have defined and figured out wonderful properties of such groups, which I can then go back and apply to physical systems which have this symmetry and I can try to understand what's happening. Right? So this is a, a, this is basically it. Okay, except that here what I'm talking about are finite groups. Okay. You know, in nature, really symmetries abound, you know, they, they abound in nature. What is this? This is a beautiful butterfly. What is the symmetry of this butterfly? I have written it here. It's a symmetry of reflection. You can see that. It's really beautiful. You couldn't even draw better than that. Nature is absolutely fantastic. And this one is the best of them all. The snowflake. And this object, you can realize, just look at it. How many symmetries does it have? First, it has rotational symmetry. How many, what angles? 60, 120, right? Three. But is there, are there more symmetries? Reflection symmetries, right? So if I reflect through this, I get the same thing. If I reflect through this, I get the same thing. If I reflect through this axis, I get the same thing. And now I can combine these reflections and inversions and I can look at that big set and try to figure out if this set forms a group. Again, I leave it to you as a small exercise to figure out if the rotations and inversions form a group or not. But this is symmetry. Okay? Actually, even Leonardo da Vinci, I hope you know his name. Okay? So he actually has this famous painting, uh, what he calls the Vitruvian Man, because there was this uh, Vitruvius, he was a mathematician, and he had said that the ratio of the limbs of a human being or of a man, they would not call it a human being, a man, it was always a man. So the ratios of the limbs of a man had to be in certain proportion. And what he has done is he has drawn this, but actually it is not exactly the golden ratio of uh, that Vitruvius has predicted. Actually, uh, Da Vinci was really a work, <coughs> working scientist, so he actually made and made measurements of the limbs, the relative sizes of the limbs, and then he But what is nice about this, you can see what is symmetric about it, that firstly, of course, there is a bilateral. Actually, in animal kingdom, bilateral symmetry is always seen. And then what is done is that in two orientations, in one orientation the human body is inscribed in a square, and in another orientation is inscribed in the cell. These are different aspects of the symmetry. Now, I wanted to show you, I showed you the snowflake, which had both rotational and reflection symmetries. But now if I take this by, same picture that I showed you, I take the same picture, but I wrote reflect to a mirror. Now it is not at all the same. So I can have rotational symmetry, but no reflection symmetry. I can also have, and there are somebody already started telling me anti-symmetry, which is good. Okay. You know, one of the seven wonders. I'm sure that if you go and zoom in, you will see that all these pictures are symmetric. If you look at these friezes or these designs, they are all congruent. That means they are all just copies of each other. There is a translation. So if I think of this outer pedestal, there is a rotational symmetry of just the pedestal. I actually have no idea whether there are four doors equally symmetrical like this in Taj Mahal. The last time I saw Taj Mahal was when I made a decades ago. <laughs> All right, but this is really telling the beauty of 
the farm that's symmetric as well. It's absolutely one of the most beautiful of symmetric. This is something that I've taken from the Conatic book. Please observe complete symmetry. Even this woman is sitting here worshipping this God. And they are exact copies of the reflection. This is the famous Koran temple and the Koran hill. It used to appear on our notes. I don't remember anymore now whether they are there, which is there anymore. I have forgotten. But again, I haven't looked at the actual cash for a long time. I think nobody has. <laughs> anyway, looks apart. So here actually, uh, this is something, uh, if there are, there are figures here, okay? And those figures are actually, if they were not there, this wheel would have been completely symmetric under a rotation of uh, 45 degrees, <coughs> just like the snowflake. Right now it is not because one has different figures that eight big pals are uh, depicted on those eight. So, this is just sort of understanding. In the decorations of buildings and churches, for example, the designs repeat. That's the translation of symmetry I already pointed out to you. And this is a simple sodium chloride crystal, an infinite arrangement, we say, we very little talk about it. Sodium chloride, chlorine, sodium chloride, etc. Now, what are the symmetries of this structure? Translational symmetry. Those are the most important ones, but there are many other symmetries. For example, a reflection through this. For example, a reflection through this. Now, when we discuss crystals, we discuss them in terms of unit sets. I'm sure you people have heard about that. So what do you do? You take one unit cell, stack it in one direction, then stack more in another direction, then stack in the third direction, and that's your three-dimensional crystal, right? And the three-dimensional crystal, you define a unit cell as that cell which has all the symmetries that the crystal will have. <coughs> So for example, I took my good old crystal that I had given you here and now I look at what is my unit cell. Is this the unit cell? It's not because it doesn't have, sorry this is not, I'm sorry I wanted to come back. This one is not, right? But this one has most of the symmetries. But is this the smallest one? The smallest one is here. So this is where now you are used. And what is the point of this unit cells having all the symmetries of the solid? Because then I can concentrate on just that unit cell and I can understand all the dynamics of the system. And I want the smallest one because obviously I don't want to do more work than absolutely necessary. So fine. Now I talked about translational symmetry. I talked about rotational symmetry. I talked about finite rotations to finite angles. I talked about rotations to <coughs> continuous angle. Translation symmetry that I talked about was translation to a fixed distance. That one lattice size. Okay. I have not talked about continuous translation symmetry, though I mentioned it, which we will discuss tomorrow. There is yet another symmetry that is observed in nature, and that's in shells. And what happens here? Here, you translate and at the same time you change the scheme. Okay, so there is a symmetry to this shape. But it is not the obvious symmetry that you have seen so far. It's a different shape. And it is described by a different one. The rotation group I told you is described rotations to 90 degree that rotation group was just had four elements of the rotation group. Okay. Now these guys will have different elements. But it is the same stupid mathematics that you will do. And that is the beauty. Realizing that I can describe the rotational symmetry by some group operations. Now the mathematicians give full reign to their imagination. They say, what's so special only about rotations? Why cannot I think combine the two operations? Will I get a group, a symmetry group? And lo and behold, you find in nature an object which has that. So this is really again and again telling you what is the 
use of these kinds of uh, arguments and structures. So I have already told this to you. That this is the basic language almost as much I will use here. Is that the mathematical language to describe all the symmetries is quite simple. Depending on uh, uh, two operations which leave the object unchanged, apply the one after another, you get a third symmetry operation. If you do nothing, then that's an identity operation. You can undo the operation and that will be the inverse of your operation. And all this set of all these operations will form a And this is the mathematical framework that is used very effectively to discuss effects of symmetries, not just on objects, but also on equations of motion. And that is the important point. Actually, this whole idea of groups was introduced, some of it at least, symmetry groups, was introduced by a French mathematician Galois, who actually died at a very, very young age in a duet of all the things. But what was left behind was a very small manuscript, 60 or 40 page manuscript. And in that he had introduced this idea. He was a young mathematician, so he actually discovered this whole framework to figure out the conditions under which al algebraic equations can be solved using methods of graphic As I have said the question as you can do. What do I care? How, I know, as a, for me, what is the application of this kind of thing? We don't know. Huh? But he was, Abel was there. Abel was another Norwegian scientist who had proved that you cannot in general solve a quintic equation by methods of radicals to write down an analytical solution. Say a quadratic, all of us know, right? Minus b by a, the minus b plus minus square root b square minus four ac by two. We know how to write it. For cubic also, we can. Quadratic, uh, 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 for order four, it's even simpler, so we don't, I don't even discuss it. For the order five, Abel has shown that in general you cannot have such a solution, analytical solution. But there are special situations for quintic when you do get a solution. And Galois was a pure mathematician who said, why is it that in some cases I get a solution and in some cases I do not get a simple analytical solution. And what he found, I am not at all going to tell you what it is, but I am going to tell you the basic idea that he had in it. So roots of any algebraic uh, equation, you will agree, will satisfy certain relation among themselves. You know, take a quadratic. You know that x plus times x minus, if x plus and x minus are two solutions, is equal to c by a. x plus plus x minus is b by a. Whatever. I don't care at this point. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really trying to read it out even in my mind. But you understand. I can just write down x minus x plus times x minus x minus is equal to zero. Write this equation in the same form. Equate the coefficients. I may not know the solutions. But I know that the two roots must satisfy certain relations among themselves because they are roots of this quadratic. Now for the quadratic, it's very simple. I can, I can do it trivially in my mind. So in general, associated with any, quad, any equation, you can always you know, associate some relationships like this. And without knowing the roots, you might be able to derive those relations. And if those algebraic relations, you look at a permutation. So there are, let's say, it's, it's a good cubic, there are three roots. I permute them. What is meant by permuting? I change one by two, two by three. That is something that all of you know. Sometimes I can keep the first one fixed, interchange the second and three. That's also a permutation. So I can, and you can show very easily that when you follow two permutations, one after another, you will get a third permutation which is a valid permutation. If you take a permutation, you can always find the inverse, which will take you back to the original order. You can always have identity. What does this mean? That all permutations form a group. Now you ask the question, what is the group of permutations of roots that leaves these relationships between the roots unchanged? So x plus times x minus is, what is it? C by A, again you people will, whatever it is. <laughs> so now there is a, in this the permutation is nothing complicated. Change x plus to x minus, the equation remains the same. So these algebraic equations are clearly invariant under these permutations. For cubic and so on, it starts getting complicated. 
Now, he is not even asking the question only for a content, right? He is just asking for any degree of you. So now you can figure out what are the permutations which will leave all the relationship between these roots unchanged. Let's say one such a relation is maybe A, B, C are three roots and one relation is B plus 4 by C squared is some zero. I'm just really picking it up out of my head. Then, now I change the permutation, okay, and ask, is the permuted equation also true? If it is true, then that permutation is the symmetry of that equation. So you can combine all the symmetries, permutation symmetries, which leave the algebraic relations among the roots and that will be some group again. And this has to be a subgroup of the bigger permutation group. This is where he got a key, and this I am not going to be able to tell you, but this was his key, that let me find out the associated symmetries of the equation, find out what is the subgroup, and knowing what that subgroup is, I can tell you whether this equation has a solution by method of now, you know, sort of, this is, group was something that we were just discussing. Now you see that <coughs> obviously, this is the beauty. This is really the beauty. That you are able to solve a completely non-trivial problem by using these ideas that let me look at the structure of the roots. I don't even know the roots. I just ask, what are the symmetries that the roots must satisfy? Okay? So this is one example that I wanted to give you. And this is what I have said. So now I wanted to end it with the left-right symmetry. Because I showed you that animal kingdom shows left-right symmetry to individuals. So actually there has been a very really big work, there's a lot of interest in the, and people have done a lot of work and any of you are interested can look at a very nice summary in Herman White's book and listed the references at the end, where you can see why animal kingdom uh, seems to have this left-right symmetry. Okay? So, you know, in general, in absolute space will not tell us what is left and what is right. How do I define what is left and right? I say that if I move a screw in a particular sense, if the head of the screw moves up, I define that left. If I move it this way, and if the tip moves down, then that's right. It depends on what is the direction. What are you defining as the positive direction? The left and right will interchange after that. But what is important is that once you call it a left, then you are not allowed to call some, uh, something else right. Then the left and right are uniquely defined. And if you do that, light goes on. But you could have called left, right and right. That means that when I look at equations of motion, if I change my equation of motion, this is not biology, I'm talking of laws of physics. The laws of physics, at least we thought for a long time, don't change either. For example, if I talk of left circularly polarized light and right circularly polarized light, they travel with the same <coughs> velocity of light, right? There is no distinction between them. The equation that describes the motion of a left circularly polarized wave and a right circularly polarized wave is exactly the same. It doesn't care. Alright? But in animal kingdom, also we said, as I already said, is that there is this sort of symmetry. And the development of biological shapes into, you know, if you ask in animal kingdom, if there was no gravitation, the best shape would have been spherical. But there was gravitation. So that gave me a direction. Animals move. That picks a positive direction for the second axis. So the only axis that is left undetermined is left. Dorsal ventral, there is a definite definition. Forward, Backward, there is a definite uh, direction. It's only the left-right for which there is no definition, and which definition is fixed by the sense of the screw. Okay. So, uh, philosophically, as you know, right is always considered right. <laughs> I 
and the word for left in Latin is sinister. <laughs> but in nature, do we have this? In nature, for example, there are these animals called gastropods, and there are these shells. Initially, both this shell is left oriented, this shell is right oriented. Now, this shell has become extinct. So now you don't find it. So if you just look at it now, you will always find this shell. So you ask a question, does this mean symmetry is broken? I will try to answer late on the next slide. But there is also this famous fact that all of us know, that amino acids in principle can be left-handed or right-handed. These two are not the same, right? They cannot just go on top of each other. They are different. And in nature, almost all proteins use only left hand amino acids. So most of the molecules that are created organically by our bodies or by anybody in the universe are left. But that doesn't mean that chemically you cannot synthesize them. In fact, you can chemically synthesize and that you can see that it, can, it is stable, it can be synthesized and it can be used. Except, for example, there is a sugar and what we eat is the right sugar, dextrose, that's why it's called dextrose, dext is right. The other sugar actually also tastes sweet, but our body simply cannot use it. There is no interaction between that sugar molecules and our body. Okay. And the most terrifying one of this was, the last one, there is a thing called thalidomide, which was chemically synthesized, its sample contains both L and R molecules. People, when they did the patient testing, they only used the natu naturally available one, which was, uh, I don't know, either left or right. And that worked fine, but then this was chemically one that was given. This was given to women from having normal sickness. It actually had a very bad effect. It was a big tragedy and big scandal because deformed babies were born because the wrong kind of heterogeneity, the molecules recognize it. Correct? So it's very important. The chirality is an extremely important property. So left-right symmetry is a good property. But left or right itself, that is what is called chirality, is also a very important. So the breaking of this left-right. If you had only chiral things, if you had only left in the world and no right, then left-right symmetry would be broken. So now you can ask me a question. Do, and there is a lot of, uh, I am going to skip this because I am really running rate of time, rate and, uh, and time. But then you ask question, is this symmetry breaking? Actually not. Why? Because if you chemically synthesize, both types of molecules can be synthesized. If there was really broken, you should not be able to synthesize that. This was in some sense an accident. You know, and this is something, you know, you have a set of ants going. And ants always follow the other ants, no? So the first ant decided to go towards right. So suddenly all of them go towards right. Does that mean right and left are asymmetrical? No. This particular configuration is asymmetrical. So that is what you can say, and that's what I think chemists have done experiments now to agree, that this seems to be the case. That's a big topic of discussion, why all the proteins have only left amino acids. I'm not going to go into that. Chirality of life and so on and so forth. But that's a different story. But I would not say that that's symmetry breaking at the level of laws of physics. But is there symmetry broken at the level of laws of physics? Indeed it is, because there is a famous beta decay that I'm sure everybody has heard about. And in beta decay, you can actually see what is the handedness of the electron. What is meant by handedness? We learned this. Handedness is the sense in which, so if the momentum of the electron and its spin direction are parallel to one another, that's one handedness. If the momentum and the spin are opposite, that's another handedness. And what you find is that the electrons that are produced in the beta decay are of only one handedness. Whereas, as I told you, <coughs> by left circle polarized light and right circle polarized light, electrons interact with both of them and electrons exist both, both handedness. But we think is, we always produce only left hand. So weak interactions somehow discriminate between left and right. Now, how is that possible? That's again the point of my third lecture, so we will come to that. How can I make this consistent? 
But right now, this is a breaking of the networks. So this is an example where symmetry is broken. So both symmetry and its breaking are very important. And I want to keep you with a wonderful statement by Feynman. So he said our problem is to explain where symmetry comes from. So where does the symmetry exist? And actually, we, why does the symmetry exist? We don't quite understand it very often. But the point that he was trying to get is that why is it that the nature is nearly symmetrical? It is broken somewhere a little bit. Like this beta d case I have told you about. I will tell you numerically how much it, this breaking means in the next lecture. But it's broken. So he said the only thing we might suggest is something like this. There is a gate in Japan. A gate, the word he used was Naiko, but actually the place is Nikko. So I have just corrected it which is sometimes called by the Japanese the most beautiful gate in all Japan. Various other things he says in between. And then one looks closely at the gate, one sees that the elaborate and complex design along one of the pier, pillars, one of the small design elements is called upside down. Otherwise, it's completely symmetrical. So they have put the error there so that the gods would not be jealous with human beings <laughs> for having had the most beautiful thing or most symmetric thing. So he says, maybe we should also turn the idea around and think that the true explanation of the real symmetry of nature is this, that the God made the laws only nearly symmetrical and not exactly symmetrical because we would not be jealous of his perfection. <laughs> so I will leave you with this picture. This was this famous gate. And these are these four pillars in fact and there are pillars inside. And then I have a better picture here where you see that these are the three pillars. On these three pillars, you have this design, and on this pillar, you have this. It's completely symmetrical, except. So, symmetry and symmetry breaking both seem to be extremely important, and we hopefully we will learn about that. Thank you. This is an article by St. Professor Mukunda and I would also like to say quite proudly that the American Journal of Physics had in fact brought out beginning in 1968 what they call a source letter, resource letter. They bring this out for physics teachers, physics students to learn about the subject. And as you can see in 1968, 63 was when we got a Nobel Prize for Symmetry. So after that everybody said yes, everybody has to understand what are symmetries in physics. So there is this resource letter and I was very happy to see that in this resource letter there is also a paper by Professor Mukunda listed as one of the seminar papers in the subject that a person who needs to understand symmetry should read about. And his thoughts are something that uh, are there in this uh, particular uh, article in this book called Images of 20th Century Physics. I can share most of these articles. I have soft copies. People can have access to it. And I find that some of these articles and books make splendid readings because people try to explain these rather complicated concepts in sometimes non-mathematical terms, sometimes mathematical terms. Thank you. Thank you so much for this engaging lecture. So